My name is Stephanie, and I'm so glad you decided to join us on YouTube today. We have an exciting message for you today, so make sure that you're engaged, leaned in, and taking notes. Also, be sure to like and share this video. And if you haven't yet, be sure to turn on notifications and subscribe so you can stay up to date with everything happening on our YouTube channel. Now let's jump into the sermon. We're going to continue our series in God in the Ugly. And here's where we are so far. We have unpacked the ugly of depression. We've talked about spiritual strongholds, living on empty, temptation, the wait time between hearing and receiving God's promise in our life. How many of you know there's ugly that can take place between those two points of hearing the promise of God and receiving the promise of God? I know I may be one of the most impatient people that you probably know, but I struggle between hearing and receiving God's promise. But today, we're going to unpack the ugly of end times. Okay, that went over like a lead balloon today. <clears throat> We're going to unpack the ugly of end times. The end times is a term used to describe the beginning of the end of life on earth as we know it. As we observe our world, it's not difficult to believe the end has already started. How many this morning would just simply raise your hand and say, Pastor, I believe we're there. I believe the end has already started. As I have stated many times, we are literally on the front porch of eternity, meaning that Christ could return at any moment. Most people, including non-Christ followers, are interested or at least intrigued with the end times. There's a lot of questions today inside the church and outside of the church. Questions like, how will the end come to an end? How do we know that we're close? And when is this going to take place? Well, I want you to know that this conversation is not a new conversation that it's been happening even all the way back to Jesus' time. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 24 this morning. Matthew chapter 24. And uh, we're going we're gonna to wade in on or listen in on a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. So are you ready? Here we go. Chapter 24, begin reading in verse 3. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip down to about the last half of that. One of his disciples, here's what they said. Said, what sign... Will signal your return and the end of the world. Verse 4, Jesus said, Do not let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and the kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Verse 9, then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Verse 11, and many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. Underline that word rampant. You know what it simply means? It means that it will increase. That's all it means. It means that sin will only increase and the love of many will grow cold. So when I read that, does that sound a little familiar to you today? Is that not a true picture of our culture in which we are living? When you think about deception, wars, persecution of Christians, it's happening around the world, even within the United States of America. You think about this watered-down, feel-good version of the truth that people are turning to. People are turning on each other. They're hating each other. And sin is out of control. I mean, when you look at what's taking place in this world, every time I think it cannot get worse, it only gets worse. Sins of sexual perversion, lust, and adultery are celebrated in our culture and they are tolerated within the walls of the church. People cheer today the killing of unborn children all in the name of my body and my choice. Transgenderism is being taught as an alternative lifestyle to our grade school level students. I want you to hear me this morning. This is not about politics. This is about biblical truth. This is an attempt of the enemy himself 
to take away the identity of the next generation. It's been a trick that he's used all the way back in the Old Testament. All you have to do is go back and look when the children of Israel were taken captive by Babylonians. It's an attempt to steal the identity. It's important that you as mom and dad every day look your kids in the eye and tell them, who they were created to be. Come on, in the name of Jesus, I want you to know God, our creator, he created this next generation and there's an attempt to take away their identity. It's time that we look our kids in the eye. It's not about politics. This is about biblical truth and tell them this is who you are. It doesn't matter what you hear at school. It doesn't matter what your friends tell you. I'm here to tell you, this is who Jesus Christ has created you to be. He has a divine purpose for your life. Life, and he has a plan for your life today. The lid of lawlessness and evil has come completely off. But here's the real truth in the ugly of end times. According to George Barner research, 47% of millennials believe it is wrong to share their faith. So about 47%, almost half of millennials who claim to be a Christ followers, believe that the Great Commission To take the gospel into all the world should not be. It's offensive and it's wrong to share our faith. I say, God help us. It's the purpose of the church to take the gospel into all the world. Now we may not want to hear it. It may be offensive to some. It's been offensive to others since the beginning of time. I'm not responsible for the message, but I am responsible as a messenger to share the great commission with each and every one that I know today. Only 12% of children's and youth pastors hold a biblical worldview. I'm thankful this morning that your kids are hearing the truth, whether it's in nursery or upstairs today, that they are hearing the truth. I am thankful they hear the truth on Wednesday night in Northwest Youth. I am thankful today that we have youth pastors and children's pastors at Northwest Church that have a biblical worldview phase. Without, a, without, you know, you look at this. Let me go on a little bit. Attendance, church attendance, engagement, giving, and serving as an all-time low. You know, I, I just grew up in a different time. I get that. But church is either important or it's not important. I grew up, if you had 105 degree temperature, I'm not saying come to church if you did, but in those days we did. It wrapped you up in a blanket, put you on the front row, and everybody in church would come by and lay hands on you and pray for you. Yank on you, pull on you. And even if you did not get better, you faked it because you had to get out of there and get back home where you could at least feel a little bit better about the situation. I just grew up. We never had a conversation at our home. Are we going to church today? And yet I'm talking about Christ followers. They say today that if you attend church one out of four Sundays, that's a regular attender. There's not anything regular about one out of four. I'm not talking about you. You're here today. (laughs) Talking about all those people who are not here today. Share this message with them today. But, you know, without, without a biblical worldview, it's discouraging And it's depression, depressing. But when we view the end times from a biblical perspective, it's more encouraging than discouraging. Here's why. Because the end of life as we know it on earth is only the beginning of an eternal life with Jesus Christ. So how can we be discouraged when we know as soon as this life is over, we're going to be with Christ Jesus forever? How can we live in fear today when we know when this life is over that we are going to be in the presence of Christ? Because if we really believe that in our hearts, we're not going to be discouraged and we're not going to be living in fear. Rather, we're going to be excited about the end expectation and the anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a day that's going to be. Jesus said in John chapter 14, began reading verse one, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. That word trouble, the Greek word for trouble was a word used to describe the waves of the ocean. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when everything is right, 
Does that not get you guys excited? That even as I'm preaching to you this morning, that they are getting your house ready, that they are making room for you in heaven this morning, that ought to get somebody excited about what is coming. He says, when everything is ready, he said, I'm going to come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. So in the ugly of the end times, in the ugly and more ugly of the end times, I'm going to give you three things that I want you to take home with you today. Are you guys ready? Let's get out of Matthew. Let's get over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. Because number one, it's in your notes this morning. In the ugly of the end times, when you find yourself discouraged with what's going on in the world, when you find yourself living in fear because this world is literally spinning out of, it's just spinning out, it's just nuts today what's happening. Don't live in fear. But number one, don't lose hope. Number one, it's in your notes, don't lose hope. Chapter 4, verse 13 says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, this is Paul talking, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have what? No hope. Now, the word hope here is not used in a way that, in which you and I use this word hope. We use this word like this. We say things like, well, I hope that it doesn't rain, which means it maybe it will, maybe it won't. I hope I have a good day at school tomorrow. Maybe I will, maybe I won't, but chances are it's probably not going to happen, but there's just this hope. I hope this happens at work. I hope I get a bonus. I hope I get a raise or a promotion. I hope it happens. It may or may not happen, but that's not the word here. That's not how it's used. Here's what it means. The word hope means an expectation of what is certain, and it means a joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. So we, our hope this morning is not based on, well, the return of Christ. It may or may not happen. No, it is a joyful, it is a confident expectation that the return of Jesus Christ is going to happen. And if it's going to happen, then it gives me hope today, regardless of what's going on around my life or in my life, regardless of what's going on in this world today, I can have a joyful, a confident expectation that I'm on the front porch of waiting for Jesus Christ to return. You see, the believers at Thessalonica, they had this idea, they had this thought that their loved ones who had already gone on, that now they were going to miss out on the return of Christ, meaning they died, which means they were, that's why Paul's writing this letter to them. So they were concerned that they were going to miss out on the return of Christ. But Paul wanted them to understand that death it's not the end. Can somebody say amen right there? That death is not the end. Rather, it's only the beginning. We have the hope not only of his return, but the hope to live with him throughout eternity. In the ugly of end times, come on, guys, get your heads up. Be encouraged today and start anticipating and expecting the return of Jesus Christ. How many are ready? Come on. I said, how many are ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Because if we really believe that, in our hearts, there's no way we would be discouraged. There's no way we'd be living in fear today. The longing for heaven. I said the longing for heaven. What a day that's going to be when Christ returns. I can't wait to get to heaven. I have a mom. I have a dad. I have a sister already there. I have grandparents already there. I have Lisa. I'll be excited to see her again. <laughs> Once she gets over the shock that I make it, <laughs> then she might be excited to see me again. Come on, guys. Do we not have more reason today, more excitement today, more reasons to look forward to the return of Jesus Christ? Again, if you believe that in your heart, how can you be discouraged? How can you live in fear of what's taking place in this world? Worst thing happens, we die. Hallelujah. The reason we don't really get excited about that because I believe sometimes in our hearts we really don't believe that. We think that's all there is. It's what's down here. We don't get caught up in the distress and doubt of others who have no hope. Verse 17 says, Then together with them who are still alive and remain on the earth. This is Paul talking to the church of believers. He said, we're going to be caught up in the clouds to meet with the Lord forever. And we're going to live with him forever and ever and ever. Isn't that exciting that we're going to be there? The hope reminds me often of an old gospel hymn. This world is not my home. 
He is waiting for me at heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. You know, I think what's happened to a lot of us in the church today that we've fallen asleep. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. We, we put all of our eggs in the basket as if we're going to live in this earth and on this earth forever and ever. There's nothing wrong with saving money. There's nothing wrong with investing in your 401k. There's not anything wrong with building a new house. There's not anything wrong with a nice car or having nice clothes or wanting nice things. You know, as long as that does not become the main thing. I want you to hear my heart today. The Bible tells us not to store up treasure here on this earth. Why? Because all of these things are going to rust. All of these things are going to be burned up one of these days, but to put our hope and our trust, listen to this, and build a treasure that is in heaven, because why? All of these things are here. I'll talk more about it in a moment, but they're all going to burn up and they're all going to be gone, but the things that we store up in heaven are going to last forever and ever, so look forward to the treasure in heaven and not for treasure here on earth. Hope of heaven sounds better each day. Is your hope in the temporal or the eternal? Put your hope in things there, not here. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to be deserved in judgment. Think about it. Everything on this earth will be burned up. All of your clothes, all of your investments, your home, your automobile, Everything that you see on this earth, one day, the return of Christ, it's all going to be gone. That's why, again, it's okay to invest. It's okay to prepare for your future. But we must do it with the understanding that this is only temporary. That we're only renting here on earth. That we're only pilgrims, as the Bible says. And that we're only passing through. That we're going to be here for a little while and we're going to be gone. If we really believe that, would we put more focus on storing up treasure in heaven than storing up treasure on earth? Would it change the way we think? Would it change the way we feel? Would it change the way we behave? Would it change the way we live if we truly had that hope in our hearts of the return of Christ? Listen to me today. Have hope. I said have hope today. It's impossible to have hope in the return of Christ and be discouraged and live in fear at the same time. You're going to live in one of those worlds. As for me, I choose hope. I'm looking forward to the return of Christ. Number two, stay alert. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 6. Paul says, <clears throat> verse 6, he says, So be on guard, be on your guard, not asleep like the others, Stay alert and be clear-headed. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Stay awake. That word stay, stay alert, that, that phrase means stay awake and keep watch. Clear-headed, another translation uses the word self-control. The picture of this scripture is one of a thief breaking in at night when everyone is sleeping. In the same way, the return of Christ will happen like a thief breaking in. And so what does Paul say? Be alert. Stay awake. Keep watch. Be on guard. Do not sleep because Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 says that no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not the angels in heaven or the son himself. Only the father in heaven knows. So all these people who claim and they're predicting and they're prophesying that the Christ is going to return here. He's going to return. No, don't get caught up in all that because the Bible clearly tells us that no one knows. The angels in heaven don't know. Jesus Christ himself doesn't know, but only God the Father in heaven knows. And so here's what we do know, that it's going to be soon and it's going to come when most people are asleep. That word asleep means, it means a moral indifference. It means spiritually asleep. How many of you recognize that a lot of us today in the church, that we are spiritually asleep? So Jesus is going to return when many are spiritually asleep. When he's going to come as a thief in the night when many people are not expecting his return. Luke chapter 17, verse 28 says, And the world will be as it was in the days of Lot. Watch this. People will be about their daily business. 
eating and drinking, buying and selling, farming and building. Look around in Northwest Arkansas tomorrow. Look around tomorrow. People are eating and drinking. People are buying and selling. They're farming. They're building. Business as usual. Look at verse 30. Yes, it will be business as usual. Right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. It will be business as usual. May it never be business as usual in our church. May it never be business as usual at Northwest Church or in our lives, in our workspace. Let us not get so caught up in work. Let us not get so caught up in family and doing and going and being that we lose sight that this could be the day of the return of Jesus Christ. Because people who are spiritually asleep, they're not alert. They're not aware at what's going on around them. So wake up and stay alert for the return of Christ is near. Don't get caught up with business as usual. Don't go through the motions of doing church. Rather be alert, actively watching and living for the return of Jesus Christ. Are you actively, are you listening? Are you watching? Are you anticipating? Are you waking up every day as you bathe your day in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to walk with you, to give you wisdom and say, Lord, I know this is what's on my calendar, but help me to be prepared on your return. Because if this is the day, I don't want it to be business as usual. I'm going to go about doing my business. But as I go about doing my business, I'm going to be looking and watching and staying alert for the return of Jesus Christ. We got to stay alert. We got to be ready. Again, are we morally, spiritually alert? Are we ready for his return? If he came today, would you need one more visit to the altar? When Christ returns, there's not going to be a timeout. There's not going to be the pause button. And there's not going to be this, oh Lord, I need one more trip to the altar. Oh Lord, I need one more prayer. Here's what I know. We will either be ready or we will not be ready. Don't live scared. Live prepared. I said, don't live scared. Live prepared. And a lot of people today are living scared. Or a lot of cross followers today are living scared. I get it. We have every right to be concerned about what's going on in our nation and what's going on in our world today, what's going on in our school system, what's going on in our families, what's going on in our churches. We got every reason to be concerned, but that does not equal scared. We don't have to live scared, but we must live prepared. We must live each and every day as we're preparing that today could be the day that the Lord could come. You know why? Live as he could return at any moment because he could return at any moment. Stop playing games with God. I want you to hear my heart. Some of you need to stop playing games with God. You need to stop living in sin. And you need to start expecting the return of Jesus Christ. You see, your life is not a movie that you can rewind or a book that you can erase or rewrite. You only get one chance to be ready. And ready or not, he is coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52 says, It will happen in the moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, and when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living also will be transformed. Stay alert. Watch out. Be ready for the return of of Jesus Christ. Now here's why I think a lot of Christ followers really don't believe that. It's because how we live. Are we living in such a way that we're watching, that we're on alert, that we're not asleep, that we're literally waiting and watching and preparing for the return of Jesus Christ? When's the last time we said today could be the day the Lord returns. So whatever you need to get right in your house, get it right. I just had this conversation with a young man the other night. Whatever you need to get ready, get ready. Because we are running out of time. And if you, will, if you believe that as a Christ follower, then start living your life preparing for the return of Jesus Christ. 
Again, it's not to scare you, but it's to prepare you. But for some of us, we might need a little, a little scare every once in a while. I'm not talking about a ghost or a goblin at, at, at Halloween. I'm talking about the thought of the return of Jesus Christ, and I'm not ready. It would keep me up at night as a non-Christ follower. When I was running from the Lord, it would keep me up at night. And I would go to bed and say, Lord, please don't come back tonight because I'm not ready. Come on, church, hear my heart today. We got to stay alert. We got to watch out. We got to be prepared. Listen, when I read the Bible, I look at this. All of this is in alignment with what the Bible has already predicted and prophesied about everything that's going to take place in the end return. I'm here to tell you guys, we got to be ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Not to live scared, not to live in fear, but to live with that hope that for certain he is coming back to get us. Number two, stay alert. Number three, be an encourager. I'll show you where I got this. Chapter 5, verse 11. So encourage. I know, you're blown away with my creativity, aren't you? <laughs> so encourage each other. Build each other up, just as you're already doing. That word courage there in Greek, the Greek word for encourage, is translated as to comfort. So encourage, comfort each other, Build each other up as you're already doing. The words encourage each other is a repeat of chapter 4, verse 18. Despite persecution and grief over the loss of loved ones, they were encouraged to encourage each other. The most effective way to be encouraged is to be an encourager. I want you to watch this. So as we encourage others, we ourselves, we get encouraged. It's one of the it's one of the foundational, it's one of the bedrock principles that I learned after the passing of Lisa. That when I heard of someone losing a spouse, I would reach out to them. I would send a note, send a message, send a book to encourage them. Let them know every once in a while, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying about you. You know what I learned? Is that when I reached out to encourage other people who were experiencing the same grief that I was going through, guess what happened to Joe? I became encouraged. And when I would come up on Sunday morning and stand there, whether I felt like it or not, when I stand on this platform and encourage you and exhort you with the word, guess what would happen to Joe? I would be encouraged and it would be enough to get me back the next week. Listen to me. If you're discouraged, start encouraging. Quit whining. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Come on. Quit waiting for someone to come to you and encourage you. Stop saying no one likes me. No one encourages me. Come on. Get up every day and say, self, I'm going to encourage other people to Day, and you will find at the end of the day, you're going to be more encouraged than when you started. If you will simply encourage somebody, open a door for somebody, come on, give them a smile, give them an encouraging word, but make it a point each and every day. I'm going to be an encourager in a world that is filled with discouragement. How many of you recognize it is almost impossible to encourage too much today? Oh, you just can't do it. Someone one time said, flatter me and I may not believe you. Criticize me and I may not like you. <laughs> Ignore me and I may not forgive you. But encourage me and I will never forget you. Encourage to be an encourager. That's what Paul is saying. He said, I know you're grieving, but encourage anyway. He said, I know you're facing persecution, but guess what? Encourage anyway. Encourage others as your own soul cries out to stop and give up and walk away. Encourage people today. People are hurting struggling and ready to give up. Make it a daily habit. Make it a daily goal. Today, I'm going to find one person and I'm going to encourage one person. You see, our encouragement to others should be sincere. It should be very specific and it should be frequent. Cheerleaders never stop cheering. Don't just walk by people on Sunday morning, but look at them and give them a big smile and say, I'm glad you're here today. Come on, guys. And when you drop your babies off in the nursery, give them a great big smile and say, thank you for serving today. Thank you for teaching my kids about Jesus Christ today. When you pass the door greeters, greet them back. Come on, say, thank you for serving today. Thank you for being here. When you walk by somebody operating a camera, don't scare them, but say, thank you for being here today. Come on, guys. I I mean, and when Pastor Joe's up here screaming and spitting, encourage him. Say amen. Say preach to me. 
Hey. <laughs> now you're being smart, Alex. In a world filled with, listen, your connect group leaders, encourage them. People who serve every weekend, encourage them. Every time you go somewhere, just make it a point. I'm going to encourage somebody today. In a world filled with discouragement, make a difference with an encouraging word and an act of kindness. And I'm almost done, but you got to listen to this. Something that I pray every day or try to pray every day. Lord, help me to be sensitive to your spirit. Somebody needs a big tip today. Lord, let me be sensitive. Let me bless somebody who needs a blessing today. Somebody needs a tank of gas today. Lord, speak to me. Help me to be alert. Help me to be alert. Someone just needs me to hold the door open. A smile. Just, I want to be sensitive today to you speaking to my heart. Some people call it a random act of, a, of kindness. Pastor Rod Loy, I love this. He calls it immediate obedience. Just be obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Treat others the way you would want to be treated if you were in their shoes. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. I'm closing for the second time. Let us not neglect in meeting together, as some people do. People today, did you know that they say that if you attend church one out of four Sundays, that's regular attendance? That's one of the most stupid things I've ever heard in my life. One out of four. How does that work? I've said it many times. Brush your teeth one out of four days. Husbands, go home to your wife one out of four nights. Go to work one out... Well, never mind. I can't go there. Just <laughs> take a shower one out of four days. How does that work? There's not anything regular about that, is there? Don't neglect meeting together. Some people do. But watch this. But encourage. The word encourage here, it literally means to strengthen one another. So watch this. Okay? Final closing. As you come, meet together as a body of believers. You encourage you're strengthening each other. So as the body is strengthened, you're part of the body. Guess what happens to you? See how this works? So as a Christ follower, you come to, in a setting like this. You attend your connect groups. You encourage. You strengthen each other. The body gets stronger. The body gets more encouraged. And so do you as an individual. That's how that works. So don't come and just sit in your little spot and not speak to anybody. And then get mad because no one spoke to you. <laughs> Don't come to church and not connect with others and get mad because nobody connected with you. Stop that. I said stop that. Connect with other people. Smile at other people. Don't wait for somebody to come to you because somebody else is think, thinking the same thing as you. Okay, I'm done. Bow your heads, please. Thank you for joining us for this sermon today. If you made the decision to follow Christ, let us know in the comments below or at northwestchurch.tv. If God has encouraged you through this message, be sure to like or share this video with a friend. We'll see you next time.